4. Foreign Regulation The Citibank's Roger L. Farnham was a frequent visitor to Cuba in the years before and after his 1921 testimony before the U.S. Congress on the bank's involvement in the U.S. occupation of Haiti. He was a well-known figure in Cuba, having first traveled to the Republic on behalf of the Citibank in 1915, when he assisted with the early organization of the Havana branch. In the intervening years, Farnham regularly made the steamship journey from New York City to Havana to check in on the small but elegant two-story branch on Cuba Street, located in the concentration of banking houses, insurance companies, and mercantile firms known as the Wall Street District of Old Havana. He was known at the Cuban National Palace and the Citibank's country branches and sugar properties. In May 1920, Farnham's name appeared on the menu for a noonday banquet at Havana's Hotel Telegrafio, celebrating the inauguration of the Citibank Club of the Sangua La Grande branch, Canfania de Guine a la Farnham. Mm. A chicken stew named after the banker was listed alongside Variado a la Stillman mm. and Frituras a la Ellen. Mm and other lunch items recalling the city bank's executives and managers. The goodwill toward Farnham extended to the bank as a whole. For a time, the city bank was a popular institution in Cuba. It was seen as contributing to the economic growth of the Republic during World War I and in the immediate post-war period. Its heavy investments in Cuban sugar were viewed as contributing to an unprecedented period of wealth on the island an iridescent and delirious dream world of speculation and affluence that became known as the Dance of Millions, where in Haiti, Farnham was viewed as a real enemy of the Haitian people, as one observer put it. In Cuba, both Farnham and the Citibank were seen as true friends of the Republic. By the fall of 1920, Farnham's status in Cuba and that of the Citibank itself were beginning to change. By then, the sugar boom had collapsed, the dizzying speed of capital circulation had slowed to a tortured creep, money was hard to come by, and the dance of millions was almost over. Soon after, the publication of James Weldon Johnson's Nation articles excoriated Ooh. Farnham and the Citibank for their role in the U.S. occupation of Haiti. The Citibank's position in Cuba was becoming precarious. In October 1920, Cuba was racked by a banking panic sparked by the precipitous slide in the price of sugar since its peak in May. The panic pushed Cuba's banking and financial system to the edge of collapse, where money was once easy and credit bountiful, both were now tight and constricted. The government and sugar mills found themselves desperately short of cash. North American banking institutions, including the Citibank, were teetering on the edge of crises as a result of carrying high-priced mortgages on Cuban properties collateralized by sugar stocks that were worthless and in some cases non-existent. By 1921, Cuba was in the throes of the worst financial and economic crises in the Republic's short history. The crisis threatened to bring the Citibank down with it. For the Citibank, the Cuban banking crisis of 1920-21, El Croc, as it was known locally, marked the disastrous culmination of a policy of expansion and imperial banking initiated many years earlier by Frank A. Vanderlip. Ooh. It was a policy that had its parallel in Haiti, but whose impact was felt beyond the Caribbean. In Haiti, the city bank's expansion came through the control of a government bank, the National Bank of the Republic of Haiti, parentheses BNRH, in Cuba, expansion occurred through two institutional forms. On the one hand, the organization and development of an international branch network supported by the new legal regimes of the Federal Reserve System. On the other, the early and tentative use of security affiliates or stockholding adjuncts as the vehicle for the expansion of foreign investment and international financing. In both cases, both branch banks and security affiliates required the development, training, and hiring of a new group of managers and executives, including Roger Farnham. Mm. Both emerged from struggles with regulation, banking law, and jurisdictional authority. 
While the BNRH was limited to a single country, the purview of the branch organization and the investment affiliate was international, organized to compete with institutions like the Royal Bank of Canada and the International Banking Corporation, and with the goal of dominating the banking field in the Caribbean and South America. Farnham was sent to Cuba by the city bank directors to ensure the stability of the branch network and its Cuban accounts. For some in Cuba, his arrival carried with it the promise of Wall Street and the hope that through him, through the city bank, the capital necessary to start the grinding of the sugar mills and clear up the horribly clouded credit situation would be released. For others, Farnham's arrival was deserving of scorn. His appearance and the increasing prominence of the city bank in the affairs of the country signified the death of Cuban sovereignty. The banking crash represented the extension of a new regime of colonialism, wherein the country's sugar mills and commercial banks were absorbed by Wall Street, and the country's future was pledged as collateral to U.S. capitalism. For Farnham, his journeys to Cuba marked the final days of a long career as an imperial banker. The Citibank's involvement in Cuba dated back to the early 20th century, when the bank was run by Moses Taylor, the Wall Street merchant and bank president with strong ties to Cuban sugar. But it was through the bank's participation in the formation of of the Bank of the Havana, an early project of neo-colonial finance in Cuba, that it first created a physical footprint on the island. The Bank of the Havana was organized in 1906. It represented a major part of the tentative early 20th century international ventures initiated by Frank A. Vanderlyn, who at the time was still vice president of the Citibank. It grew out of the Havana-based private merchant bank, Zaldo y Cia, an institution chartered in 1860 by Spanish immigrant Guillermo de Zaldo. The original merchant bank financed sugar and railroads, including the Ferro Carril of the Baha'i, a line that stretched from Havana to Santiago de Cuba, and a warehouse and dock company serving the commerce of Havana. De Zaldo's Ooh. sons, Carlos, Federico, Ooh. and Teodoro, Ooh. continued the firm's business while solidifying its international financial connections by becoming local correspondents for Belmont & Co., and the Farmers Loan and Trust Company, both of New York, the National Discount Bank of Paris, and J. Henry Schrouder of London, a merchant bank whose interest in Cuban sugar and railroads dated from early in the 19th century. Such international connections provided the foundation for the Bank of the Havana. It was organized through a network of investors in London, Paris, Hamburg, and New York. Its initial shareholders were a group of what Vanderlyn described as a number of our friends, including the four aforementioned institutions and the Citibank, the London Bank of Mexico, and South America, Kuhn, Loeb & Co., Warburg & Co., the General Company of Credit, Industry, and Commercial, and the French Bank for Trade and Industry. The latter two concerns were among the most important of France's international baking houses and helped support its overseas commercial empire. Agents of the London Bank of Mexico and South America had researched investment conditions in Cuba three years previously and had already organized banks along similar lines in Mexico, Peru, Argentina, and Chile. British financier Sir Ernest Cassell was a stockholder and early supporter. U.S. corporate interests involved in the Bank of the Havana included the National Sugar Refining Company and the Equitable Trust Company. The London Bank of Mexico and South America and the Bank of France were the largest shareholders in the new institution, followed by the Citibank and Zaldo y Cia. Shares of the bank sold quickly. Sugar magnate Horace Havemeyer tried to acquire $100,000 worth of stock in the bank but was only able to get half that amount. Carlos de Zaldo was installed as president of the new institution. Zaldo was a prominent businessman and, as Cuban Secretary of State and Justice under President Estrada Palma, had signed the U.S.-Cuban Reciprocity Treaty. The board of directors included Spanish businessman Sebas E. Alvarez, produce merchant, 
and National Bank of Cuba director Elias Miro. Leandro Valdez of the Merchant Bank Valdez Alvarez y Cia. Jose Ignacio of the Camara, a businessman and original board member of the National Bank of Cuba. And Federico Zalman. As with the National Bank of the Republic of Haiti, two advisory boards were established, one in Paris, one in New York City. Together, they reviewed the bank's business and approved its loans. Vanderlip appointed Johnny Garden as the Citibank's representative, James H. Post of the National Sugar Refining Company and a member of the firm B. H. Howell and Son also joined the New York Committee. James C. Maritime, a Cuban who worked in the Citibank's bond department, managed the Havana headquarters. Maritime was one of the original contributors to Number 8, the Citibank's employee journal, and his essays on Cuban banking and financial conditions in Number 8 and the Bulletin of the American Institution of Bank Clerks provided U.S. bankers with an early introduction to the particularities of banking in Cuba. The Citibank also recruited John H. Durland, a Kansan who had worked with the New York Life Insurance Company and Samuel M. Yarvis North American Trust Company when they first arrived in Cuba. When the National Bank of Cuba took over the Cuban operations of the North American Trust Company, Durland organized its Matanzas branch. The Bank of the Havana opened on October 1, 1906, with an authorized capital of $5 million, with $2.5 million paid in. It was organized for foreign interests to capitalize on the expanding sugar industry and to compete with what were then the three most prominent commercial banks in the country, the National Bank of Cuba, the Spanish Bank of the Island of Cuba, and the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC. Its establishment also paralleled the advent of the second United States intervention in Cuba, 1906 through 1909, and the reestablishment of U.S. rule under the governments of William H. Taft and Charles Magoon. For Vanderlip, the U.S. occupation of Cuba offered a business opportunity. He argued U.S. officials to instate the Bank of the Havana as the government's fiscal agent in Cuba. The Havana manager wrote to Magoon that the bank would fulfill any banking functions required of the U.S. authorities. The U.S. administration, however, was disinclined to make any changes to the existing arrangements through which government funds were held and dispersed. Vanderlip persisted. He pointed to the international character of the administration of the new bank and its plans to open agencies in Cardenas, Matanzas, Seguay, Santiago de Cuba, Cienfuegos, and other cities in Cuba. Furthermore, he argued that the Bank of the Havana is as much American as it is a Cuban institution, and this feature in itself ought to have weight with the deciding authorities and the choice of its fiscal agent. Vanderlip also pointed out that he had received information that the RBC was attempting to bid for the government deposits. Indeed, in October, Francis J. Sherman, manager of the RBC's Havana branch, wrote to Taft, offering the bank services to the U.S. military authorities. We would feel very much chagrined if they were successful over and above our efforts in this respect, wrote Vanderlip. And I would therefore ask you to do what is needful to see that the weight of your influence is thrown in our direction. Taft eventually designated both the Bank of the Havana and the National Bank of Cuba depositories for treasury funds. Yet despite the infusion of capital, the fortunes of the Bank of the Havana during its first years of operation were mixed. Stockholders of the Bank of London and Central and South America reported that the Havana Bank had not shown a dividend in its first half year of operation. A year later, little had changed. In 1908, contradictory rumors circulated with Havana's business press surrounding the bank's fate. On the one hand, it was reported that Edmund G. Vaughn and the National Bank of Cuba were going to absorb the Bank of the Havana and that Zaldo had been pushed out. 
On the other hand, it was speculated that Carlos DiZaldo had been authorized by J.P. Morgan to begin negotiations with Vaughn with the intention of the Citibank assuming practical control of the National Bank of Cuba's operations. The press suggested that the talks of mergers and liquidation emerged from a realization that there simply was not enough banking business in Cuba to sustain both institutions and warrant the extent of the bank's capitalization. In reality, the Citibank had sent Garden to Havana with the intention of reducing the bank's capital as a process of, as Vanderlip put it, the elimination of the French interests, a prospect that Vanderlip saw as desirable. By 1909, the desire for the elimination of European financial interests in the Caribbean was not confined to Vanderlip's stake in the Bank of the Havana. Under President William Howard Taft, and his Secretary of State Philander Knox, the use of finance and banking was emerging as a potent tool of U.S. diplomacy, a policy of dollar diplomacy, of purportedly substituting dollars for bullets. According to the policy, private banks, financial advisors, and experts, and foreign states worked together in an attempt to bring political stability to the Caribbean region through the organization of nominally national government banks, through the institution of currency reform and the refunding of sovereign debt, and by taking control of customs collection and revenue distribution. In this context, Vanderlip found Taft enthusiastically pro-business and supportive of the Citibank's expansionist desires. It would be more nearly impossible at the present time to obtain some color of government patronage or at least very cordial goodwill for a South American banking enterprise in the right hands than ever before, Vanderlip wrote to Stillman. Mr. Taft is particularly anxious to see some steps taken toward closer commercial relations. While the Citibank was not a private bank, it actively sought to benefit from the policy. Yet the Citibank's participation was limited. Vanderlip's approach was cautious, Stillman's even more so. He rejected the potential participations deemed too risky. Furthermore, the propositions were sometimes defeated locally as national congresses voted against them in the interests of economy and national sovereignty. The range of proposals considered by the Citibank was vast. Vanderlip refused a proposition from the government of Guatemala and was offered but turned down a contract to refund the Nicaraguan debt. At the suggestion of Knox, the Citibank alongside Spire & Co. purchased stock in the National Bank of Haiti and participated in the consortium led by Kuhn, Loeb & Co. that refunded European loans to the Republic of Liberia, their first venture on the African continent. The Citibank proposed refunding the entire Costa Rican debt then held in Europe. It wanted to flow a loan through which the entire customs duties were pledged to the bank, and in the case of default, the United States was granted the right to military intervention. However, the Costa Rican government rejected the contract. The Citibank had similar issues two years later during negotiations with Honduras. The Citibank was part of a consortium that included J.P. Morgan & Co., Kuhn Loeb & Co. and the First National Bank of New York that proposed to reorganize the finances of the government of Honduras. But the contract, which would have contained concessions for the National Railway, a government bank, a commercial bank, and control of customs collections in addition to flotation of a $10 million loan, was rejected by the Honduran National Congress. During this period, Vanderlip had conversations with both W.R. Grace & Co. and J.P. Morgan & Co. regarding the possibility of jointly establishing a South American bank. At one point, they considered former Secretary of State Robert Bacon as its head, a plan U.S. President Taft approved. Vanderlip backed out of a syndicate with the German bank and Spire & Co. for what became the Mexican Bank of Trade and Industry. Vanderlip also considered purchasing an already existing international bank outright and absorbing its branches into the Citibank fold. He watched the growth and progress of Thomas Hubbard's International Banking Corporation and had John E. Garden investigate its condition and reputation with the potential aim of purchasing it. 
Vanderlip also coveted the Caribbean branch networks developed by the Royal Bank of Canada and the Bank of Nova Scotia. In 1909, Vanderlip considered a proposal from Citibank Vice President Joseph H. Talbert, who argued that the Citibank should buy the Bank of Nova Scotia wholesale. The Bank of Nova Scotia was founded in Halifax in 1832 and had developed a modest branch network in the British West Indies, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Talbert suggested that the Citibank purchase the Bank of Nova Scotia, close its Canadian branches, and move its staff to the Caribbean, providing the Citibank with a ready-made form branch network. Nothing came of Talbert's plan to purchase the Bank of Nova Scotia, or of any of the grand schemes for international expansion Vanderlip considered. Instead, the Citibank's problem of foreign expansion was addressed in a surreptitious and indirect fashion through a question of domestic regulation and the debate over the legality of the National City Company, NCC. The NCC was a stockholding adjunct, parentheses sometimes referred to as securities or bastard affiliate, organized by Vanderlip in July 1911. The NCC was modeled after the first securities company, FSC, the affiliate of George F. Baker's Ew. First National Bank of New York, organized in 1908. Ew. Baker and the First National had wanted permission for the bank to engage in the buying and selling of stock in other national banks and other corporations, but had been informed by the Comptroller that this was illegal under the National Bank Act. To do so, they organized the FSC, similar to the International Banking Corporation with its parallel organization of a state bank, the International Bank with a state charter, FSC was legally a separate entity from the First National Bank. However, its trustees were the First National's president, vice president, and cashier. First National sold stock to the FSC at below market value so that it could engage in the sale and marketing of securities not permitted by the bank itself. Commercial and investment functions were effectively combined, as there was little but a legal conceit separating the two entities. The profits of the SFC garnered for the First National's directors were reportedly 12% annually. Hundreds of other banks in the country had established securities affiliates since Baker organized the FSC. However, the size of the Citibank attracted scrutiny from the federal bank regulators, as did the fact that immediately following its formation, it had acquired controlling interests in banks across the country, disregarding the provisions of the National Bank Act and leapfrogging regulatory hurdles meant to restrict monopoly and concentration in banking. With the initiation of the Pujo Committee investigation led by attorney Samuel Uttermeyer and its inquiries into the question of concentration and control in banking, the Citibank and the National City Company came under suspicion. An assistant U.S. District Attorney paid a visit to Vanderlip at the suggestion of the Solicitor General. He desired to have full information in regard to the organization and purposes of the National City Company. Vanderlip initially obliged. He was convinced of the legality of the National City Company and wanted to appear magnanimous, open, and cooperative. His open-spirited approach to the investigation soon turned sour. Vanderlip bristled at the incursions the Attorney General made into the private records of the bank. He felt that the investigation was led by anti-business radicals who had created the boogeyman of a money trust to score political points. And while the Attorney General felt that the NCC was accomplishing by indirection what was expressly prohibited by the spirit and in the letter of the National Bank Act, Vanderlip claimed that given the inadequacy of federal banking regulation, it was the only way forward. Wary of the scope of the investigation, Vanderlip mobilized a team to lobby the offices of the Attorney General and the White House. Milton Alley, one of the liaisons in Washington, formerly of the Treasury and the director of Briggs National Bank in Washington, got all the Treasury officials and others completely in hand, Vanderlip reported, so that they are working with us in connection with the department. 
He has relations with the Solicitor General, which I think will absolutely protect us from any difficulty so long as we show an amenable spirit. Even so, Vanderlip realized that to deflect criticism and neutralize the investigation, he would have to sever the relation that exists between the bank and the company in the form of the beneficial interest stamped on the bank stock. Explaining further that we shall have to abandon the position and issue the shares of the NCC directly to the stockholders of the bank. He transferred both the securities held by the Citibank, controlled United States Investment Company, and the incidental stock interest deposited with the bank to the NCC, moved a pool of accumulated funds not listed on the accounts of the bank to the books of the security affiliate, and sold off stock in other banks held by the NCC so as to show a disposition to reduce our holdings. In consultation with bank lawyer John Sterling, mm. and in a work of legal and political subterfuge, Vanderlip decided to recast the NCC as a foreign banking institution. He planned to develop very strongly the idea that the real purpose of the NCC is to aid in the extension of our foreign banking, particularly in South America. Writing to Stillman, Vanderlip argued that the promotion of the NCC as an entity whose main purpose was to develop the United States' presence in international banking would deflect attention from its domestic activities, as it would appear to have been organized for purposes that had been suggested by the U.S. State Department. I think we can do some things that will amount practically to doing them at the request of the State Department, which will put the government in an awkward situation to tell us to discontinue. In that way, I believe we can create a situation where we can say what is really the fact, that the taking over of these bank stocks was an incidental and by no means an imperatively important thing in the work of the NCC, that its real purpose is to do the very things that the government is urging us to do, and that we are already moving to minimize the one thing about which there seems to be any objection and are disposed further to minimize. Vanderlip announced the NCC as a foreign banking concern whose purpose was to facilitate the opening of U.S. foreign trade. The entrance of the NCC into the South American field, Vanderlip announced to the press, probably marks an epoch in the history of banking in the Western Hemisphere. It is the first real effort toward a comprehensive scheme for bringing into closer relationship this country with the countries of South and Central America. The NCC was organized, Vanderlip stated, for the purpose of bringing about eventually the extension of American banking facilities to our merchants and others doing business in Mexico and South and Central America. Altogether, the country has become largely interested in these countries and its investments relate very largely to bonds of the state of Sao Paulo the great coffee producing state of Brazil, bonds of the Argentine Republic, of the city of Lima, Peru, of Costa Rica, and of Haiti. The company is also interested in the Chinese financial situation and is one of the participants in the maturing loan. As a statement of intent, Vanderlip recruited W. Morgan Schuster and Henry Vibert Kant to embark on a year-long fact-finding mission that would examine possibilities for banking, finance, and commerce in South America. Schuster had most recently been the financial advisor to Persia. Can had a long association with the Bank of Nova Scotia, including as inspector of its West Indian branches. The trip, argued Vanderlip, will establish in the public mind a raison d'etre for the city bank company, and that is an admirable thing to do. It will show that in our efforts to extend our foreign banking relations, hampered as we are by the inadequacy of our banking laws, we have had to resort to this method. Despite the recasting of the NCC as an entity organized to promote international trade and finance, Vanderlip still worried about the impact of the Pujo Committee investigations into the Citibank's organization and operations. In an attempt to gain some assurances regarding the Citibank's status, mm. Vanderlip sent Roger mm. Farnham to have a series of informal conversations with President Taft mm. and his brother, Charles P. Taft. Mm. Farnham had just joined the Citibank from the offices of William Nelson Cromwell that March and had quickly become involved in the Citibank's international affairs. He knew the Taft mm. brothers from his work with Panama on the Canal Concession. Farnham mm. described the content of his meeting in a long memorandum sent to mm. Vanderlip in October 1911. 
The memorandum summarized his encounters with the opinions of Taft and gave a detailed account of Taft's sentence of Untemeyer, the Attorney General, and the investigation. According to Farnham, mm. Taft expressed his disgust with the character of Untemeyer and told Farnham mm. that he did not propose to play into the hands any further than by law he was absolutely required to do. Farnham noted Taft's friendly attitude toward the city bank and told him that he believed the bank's internal affairs were of no business to the public, only governments and only to make sure they were in compliance with the law. Taft told Farnham that he had no sympathy with so-called money trust investigation and actually believed that there was no such thing. He was aghast that the banking community was under investigation and was being harassed by the inquisitors, but he confessed that he was unable to intervene directly in the affairs of the Department of Justice. That said, Taft told Farnham that the Citibank had no need to worry about the outcomes of Udemeyer's prying attempts at getting confidential information from the bank, as Taft would stretch the laws as far as possible to resist the inquiries. Taft also told Farnham that if he were re-elected, he would completely gut his cabinet. He was certain that there would be a new attorney general after March 4, 1913, a fact that the president's brother, Charles P. Taft, reiterated in even plainer terms. Charles Taft told Farnham that if President Taft were re-elected, he would select an entirely new cabinet, and Attorney General Charles W. Wickersham would not be part of it. This, he said, he could absolutely assure me of. And well, I must realize that at the present time, such an announcement could not be made in any sort of public way by the president or anyone representing him. Nevertheless, he felt that I should let those whom I represented privately understand that such was to be the case. Furthermore, if Taft mm. were re-elected, he would make sure his cabinet was pro-business. At which point, Farnham suggested that the financial interests of the country should have a say in selecting his cabinet, and particularly the Attorney General and the Secretary of the Treasury, not to the end of dictating those who should be named for those positions, Farnham qualified, but in order that he should have the benefit of the judgment, advice, and knowledge of men of affairs. Taft enthusiastically agreed with Farnham. I am satisfied that should he be re-elected, Farnham wrote, such a conference between the representatives of the large financial interests and the presidents would readily be had in order that he could have such aid in the selection of some of the members of his cabinet. Taft, meanwhile, realized that his chances for re-election were slim and that if bankers and their officials advocated for him, it would probably further hurt his chances for a second term. When the Money Trust report was released, its general conclusion was that there was in fact concentration in banking, that the interlocking boards of directors of banking institutions and corporations created a dangerous concentration of wealth and money power. However, the commentary on the existence of the NCC was somewhat ambiguous. The investigations largely left the Citibank unscathed, and they were not forced to relinquish any of their holdings. But an opinion by Solicitor General Frederick W. Lehman argued that the organization and operation of the NCC expressly violated both the intentions and the law of the National Bank Act. It threatened to create the kind of monopoly and concentration in money and banking that the National Bank Act was designed in part to avoid. President mm. Taft suppressed Lehman's report. The existing order of things between the National City Bank and the National City Company was preserved. Vanderlip, mm. with the assistance of Roger Farnham mm. and others, had successfully evaded the legal orders attempting to regulate and curtail the activities of the City Bank. By 1913, the City Bank's international profile remained modest compared to the profiles of its Canadian and European competitors although it was relatively robust for a federally chartered commercial bank whose ambitions were impeded by regulations. The Citibank had interests in a commercial bank in Cuba, the Bank of the Havana, and a government bank in Haiti, the National Bank of the Republic of Haiti, and it was increasingly involved in projects encouraged by the U.S. State Department to refund the national debt and take control of currency regimes and central banks. 
It was awarded the contract for a short-term 6%, $1.5 million loan to the Dominican Republic, beating out Samuel M. Jarvis's National Bank of Santo Domingo and subsequently finding itself embroiled in the acrimonious freakus sparked by Jarvis Ooh. and Frank J.R. Mitchell. It also participated in the J.P. Morgan & Co. organized syndicate, which offered a similar short-term loan to Cuba. In 1913, W. Morgan Schuster and H. V. Kant returned to New York City after traveling first to London and then crossing back across the Atlantic and touring South America on the business-finding mission organized by Vanderlip. <laughs> Nothing concrete came of their journey. Vanderlip <laughs> thought that the Citibank might secure a 40-year charter from Panama for a government bank that would serve as the state treasury, receiving and paying all governmental transactions while having the unlimited right to issue currency, save a 33% gold reserve requirement. Vanderlip saw the Panama Bank as the potential gateway to the opening of further city bank controlled banks in Central and South America. Yet the Panama Bank was never organized, and when Schuster reported back to Vanderlip, he painted a pessimistic picture of the possibility for an expansion. Schuster feared that the Citibank and the NCC would not be able to compete with established European bankers, and that American investors would be reluctant to invest in Latin American securities given the high yields of domestic security and bond issues. Within a year, conditions in Europe would change. The Citibank would find the opportunities that Vanderlip had been searching for for almost a decade. The year was 1914. As a watershed in the history of the Citibank, a set of historic events provided Vanderlip with the platform and possibility for the foreign expansion that he and Stillman had long dreamed of, and positioned the bank to assume an international, imperial presence that would allow it to compete with its European and Canadian rivals. Together, the operationalization of the Federal Reserve Act, following its signing late in 1913, the opening of the Panama Canal in August 1914, and the onset of war in Europe brought about these new possibilities for the Citibank. It was a convergence of events that one Citibanker described as providential. The European conflict upended the global conditions for banking, finance, commerce, and trade. Shipping lanes were disrupted, severing the markets of Asia and the Americas from Europe and European agriculture and industry were devastated. The Imperial, British, French, and German banking houses active in the Caribbean and South America were disabled, depriving Caribbean and Latin American countries of their traditional sources of credit. They turned to Wall Street for their financing needs and to the United States as a market for their raw materials and agricultural products. The United States was positioned as the sole imperial power in the hemisphere. It underwent a stunning transformation from a net debtor to a net creditor as it rapidly paid off its civil war debts and repatriated the gold in U.S. government securities held in Europe, reversing a centuries-old trend and raising New York City to global prominence in international finance. While the opening of the Panama Canal reordered the geography of U.S. trade, cutting down shipping times, the United States was able to take advantage of the financial conditions brought on by the war because of the organization of the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve created an international system of discount, allowing national banking associations to handle foreign acceptances. The primary instrument of international trade, of an amount that could extend to the entirety of a given bank's paid-up capital, stock, and surplus. The permission to use acceptances in foreign trade repatriated commissions previously lost through American use of European banks. A complaint heard as early as the International American Conferences of the 1890s and promoted the dollar as an international commercial currency. In addition, Section 25 of the Federal Reserve Act permitted national banking associations capitalized at $1 million or more to establish branches outside of the United States with permission from the Reserve Board. A later clause permitted national banking associations to deploy up to 10% of their capital and surplus for the purchase of stock in corporations whose primary purpose was the American export trade. Domestic branches? 
were disallowed under the National Bank Act for fear that their expansion could lead to concentration in banking and regional control over financial and money power. In the international context, branches were seen as a necessary support for the foreign trade and commercial empire that Vanderbilt and others within the Citibank had long advocated. Vanderbilt was ready to take advantage of the new financial order. He had long been an advocate of regulatory reform, and he had participated in many of the early discussions leading to the establishment of the Federal Reserve, including the secret December 10th, 1910 meeting on George's Jekyll Island with J.P. Morgan's Henry P. Davidson, <coughs> Poon and Lowe, Paul M. Ew. Warburg, First National Charles D. North, Ew. and U.S. Senator Nelson Ew. D. Aldridge. Despite the ambivalent returns of the missions by Shuston Kan to the Caribbean and South America, these trips have provided the Citibank with a set of commercial contacts and business files. Furthermore, as part of his research into foreign trade and banking expansion, Vanderbilt had sent out questionnaires to thousands of domestic merchants and bankers inquiring after their specific needs and requirements to engage in foreign commerce. Vanderbilt quickly organized an overseas division in 1914. It was divided into two units a foreign exchange department run by Johnny e. Garden, and a foreign trade department run by Herbert R. Eldridge and Stephen R. Verhees that handled matters of foreign branch expansion. Born in Charleston, Garden learned the bankers trade in Germany before returning to the United States to work in the foreign exchange department of the First National Bank of Chicago. He developed a reputation writing and lecturing on foreign exchange, and after Vanderbilt refuses him in 1904, Garden expanded the Citibank's foreign department into the largest of any U.S. bank, handling transactions of more than $1 billion annually by 1909. Eldridge was born in Decatur, Illinois, to a wealthy family and worked for years in Texas Commercial Bank. His expert knowledge on the instrumentalities of foreign trade bringing him to Vanderbilt's attention. Verhees had joined the RBC from the Chase Manhattan Bank in 1899 and had organized the RBC's New York agency. He had traveled extensively in the Caribbean visiting the RBC's Puerto Rico and Cuba branches and was the treasurer of William Van Horn's Cuba Railroad, whose accounts were held by the bank. Both the foreign exchange and foreign trade departments were overseen by Samuel Ew. McRoberts, a city bank executive manager and former lawyer from Meatpacking Concern Armor & Co., who also sat on the board of the National Bank of Haiti. The city bank already owned stock in commercial and government banks in Cuba and Haiti, but in November 1914, it opened its first overseas branch in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Argentina was chosen largely because U.S. Steel Corporation President James Ew. A. Farrell had wanted a U.S. bank to help finance his $100 million business in that country. Farrell Ew. asked Vanderbilt to open a branch in Buenos Aires and offered to help obtain deposits from international harvester Armour & Swift, all of which were selling in Latin America, as well as access to their credit files. The accounts provided the Citibank with an immediate capital base as well as an archive of information that helped it conduct and expand its foreign business. For the Buenos Aires branch, Vanderbilt Ew. pulled together a team consisting of individuals with prior business and banking experience in the Caribbean. John H. Ew. Allen, who had been managing the National Bank of the Republic of Haiti in Port-au-Prince, James C. Martin, Ew. who had helped establish the National Bank of Cuba in 1906, Robert O. Bailey, former Secretary of the Treasury, and M.D. Correll, who had worked with the Philippine Tariff Commission and had been involved in developing trade between the United States, France, and Puerto Rico. With a staff of 10 assistants, they traveled to Argentina on November 2, 1914, and took over a suite of rooms in the Stock Exchange Building on Calle Rivadavia, near the Bank of the Nation. On November 14th, the Citibank opened its doors for business in Buenos Aires. Under Allen's management, the branch was a success. In less than a year, it had corralled nearly $4 million in deposits. And Allen proposed opening sub-branches at Rosario and Bahia Blanca, as well as in Montevideo, Uruguay. Herbert R. Eldridge wrote enthusiastically to Vanderbilt about Allen's work. 
arguing that if the city bank could keep him, he would need to be elected a vice president and allowed more time in the United States to be with his family. The city bank's competitors in Argentina were less enthusiastic. Barings Bank, for instance, realized that the war meant their long run of financing in Argentina was coming to an end and hoped that the republic would decelerate its borrowing. The Barings agents lamented the arrival of the city bank and despised the methods of Allen. Oh. They accused him of being a U.S. trade spy and complained that he was not a gentleman, simply a common North American bounder bully, entirely unscrupulous, while chafing at his aggressive business tactics. On March 17, 1915, the Federal Reserve Board authorized the city bank to establish a branch at Havana, supplemented by sub-branches in Santiago de Cuba, Matanzas, San Fuegos, Guantanamo, Camagüey, Cardenas, Manzanillo, as well as in Kingston, Jamaica, and Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. While the branches in Kingston and Santo Domingo were never organized, the authorizations were nonetheless a statement of intent for the city bank. Eldridge and Farnsworth soon journeyed to Cuba to investigate purchasing the Bank of the Havana. Though they argued over the price, quibbling over the quality of some of its assets, they agreed to buy it at par, taking over the Bank of Havana's new building on Cuba Street in the process. George E. Roberts traveled to Cuba to oversee the transition a longtime newspaper man from Iowa and a former director of the U.S. Mint. Ew. Roberts was brought on as Vanderbilt's special assistant. He ended up editing the Citibank's monthly letter for 25 years, growing its circulation to 200,000 copies. Opened on August 20th, the Havana branch was dubbed the West Indian Branch. It was to become the center of a Caribbean network, grouped under an administrative Caribbean district whose purview included both the Antillean archipelago itself and the Caribbean ports of Central and South America. Porfirio mm. Franca, a wealthy Cuban who was a founding member of the Vida du Tennis Club, was appointed manager. Like the Buenos Aires branch, the Havana branch turned a quick profit in a matter of months, in part thanks to the liquidation of moribund loans while quickly garnering new accounts. In April of the following year, a branch was opened in Rio de Janeiro, followed by sub-branches in Sao Paulo, Santos, and Bahia, the latter two cities, the centers of the Brazilian coffee and sugar trade, respectively. In August, it opened a branch in Montevideo, the center of the Uruguayan high trade, and in Valparaiso, Chile's main port, center for nitrates and coffee. Branches in Colombia and Venezuela followed, and in the coming years, Vanderbilt Ew. authorized the opening of branches in Europe. During these early days of foreign branch expansion, the Citibank also took over the International Banking Corporation, IBC, an institution long coveted by Vanderbilt. Ew. IBC founder Ew. Thomas H. Hubbard died on May 21, 1915, and the Citibank used the NCC to purchase a controlling stake in the IBC and its parallel state-chartered institution, the International Bank. The purchase immediately gave the Citibank a ready-formed and staffed system of branches in the Asia-Pacific region. By 1915, the IBC had branches in Bombay, London, Calcutta, Hankow, Manila, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, Zebu, Tianston, Kobe, Peking, and Yokohama, as well as in Colon, Panama, and San Francisco. The Citibank sold the San Francisco Bank at profit when it realized it was receiving deposits there somewhat in contravention of the law, as Vanderbilt oh. put it. Control of the IBC helped the Citibank compete with the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation and other British imperial banks in Asia. It also provided the bank with a presence on the Isthmus of Panama, where the Washington, D.C. Commercial National Bank had just arrived. Vanderbilt oh. had long watched Panama, having abandoned plans to establish Citibank branches there on multiple occasions. The Citibank purchase of the IBC initiated a debate over how best to incorporate it into the fold of the Citibank proper. While there was universal agreement as to the value of the IBC as an institution, despite its history of poor management and middling returns, Vanderbilt and the officers of the Citibank considered operating it jointly with European institutions in a cooperative venture 
maintaining it as a solely U.S. entity and folding its branches into the Citibank, effectively eliminating the IBC as an independent unit. While the strategy was slowly worked out, the IBC's management and board of directors became increasingly dominated by members of the Citibank's overseas division. Johnny Garden was elected chairman of the IBC's board, and over the coming year, HTS Three, Warren Sandigums, Guy Carey, Arthur Kavanaugh, Samuel Ooh. McRoberts, and Roger Farnham were all appointed as directors. In 1917, the IBC acquired the business of Puerto Rican banker Santiago Michelin in the Dominican Republic. Michelin remained in the IBC's management. He was joined by J. L. Oh. Mazing formerly treasurer of the insular government in the Philippines. The foreign branches had a number of functions. They provided all of the financial services of a domestic branch, accepting deposits, issuing letters of credit, handling exchange, and extending credit to individuals and business. They were also the clearinghouses for credit information on local governments and businesses. Branch representatives studied local trade conditions, alerted U.S. manufacturers of potential marketing opportunities, and explained the technical details of regional and local trade and customs protocols. They compiled monthly reports on commercial possibilities and natural resources. They offered up-to-date country profiles outlining current rates of exchange, prices of goods, and the nuances of local business culture, as well as assessments of local political conditions and their effect on business. They sent regular dispatches back to 55 Wall Street, where they were compiled and released to the Citibank's correspondent banks, private investors, and the press, and used in the monthly letter. Within its first year of operation, for example, the Buenos Aires branch produced nearly 400 reports. These dispatches were part of a broader, comprehensive system of publicity and representation initiated by Vanderlip that included writings on fiscal policy and banking reform, as well as reports on crop movements, consumer demand, manufacturing output, and labor conditions. Under Vanderlip's watch, the Citibank began producing journals, news reports, circulars, monographs, and trade manuals on foreign trade and international commerce, while initiating a coordinated pedagogical program that educated U.S. investors and merchants as well as the bank's own staff, in the protocols and etiquette of international trade and finance. The Citibank Staff Magazine No. 8 increasingly carried dispatches from the foreign branches and articles on foreign trade and commerce, and then it launched the Americas, a monthly periodical distributed free to investors and business people aiming to create a medium which will be of assistance in bringing the businessmen of the United States and South America closer together and to provide an instrument for the interchange of ideas regarding the aims and projects of Pan-American commerce. Under Vanderbilt, the Citibank also published a pamphlet series on foreign commerce. The first in the series was Oscar Phelps Austin Trading with Our Neighbors in the Caribbean. Together, these texts attempted to help both business people and the wider American public to conceptualize the United States as part of a global economy and the Caribbean and Latin America as regions worthy of investment. In establishing a comprehensive system of branches all through the Caribbean, the Citibank's Allen wrote, The National Citibank has tried to visualize the development which is certain to come to this interesting and prodigally rich part of the world. In doing so, the bank responded to what one city banker described as the United States' national ignorance, as well as to the behavior and attitudes of U.S. business people overseas. It offered a corrective to U.S. perceptions of the tropics, well aware that distance lends enchantment, as an editorial in the Americas put it. Bankers tried to debunk the scurrilous representations of foreign countries that circulated in the United States. They realized they had to counter the representations of the Caribbean and Latin America circulating in travel writing, yellow journalism, and lurid romances that offered up the region as an irreconcilably foreign space, a space marked by backward customs, racial degeneracy, and tendencies toward incessant revolution and decivilizing barbarity. 
Yet while serving as a corrective to U.S. misrepresentations of the world, these texts also often reinforce those misrepresentations, while reproducing the assumptions concerning race, culture, and difference that form the basis for many of the Citibank's policies overseas. Certainly, some of these representations evoked a quaint, if not exoticized, sense of a difference between the United States and the world. But often, one sees the unbashedly racist depictions of Africans and Indians. Irving yeah. and Bernard's essay, Five Years in Jungle Land, describing the city banker's visit to the IBC in Panama, offers a case in point, evoking, as it does, the same set of anti-black images performed through the city bank minstrel's show, as well as the racist and paternalistic accounts of Haiti by Roger yeah. Parkham and John yeah. Allen. At Kingston, Jamaica, Bernard's Ooh. first port of call after leaving New York, he describes the little N-words diving for coins thrown in the ocean for the amusement of the ship's passengers. In Panama, he encounters a tribe of West Indians who are humble, affable, bewilderingly ignorant, and quick imitators. After being wished a Merry Christmas, one Caribbean migrant repeats the greeting incessantly, but either mishearing it or as Bernard Ooh. thinks, expressing his gratitude to his northern patron, it comes out as American Christmas. Indeed, Bernard's Ooh. description of Panama's West Indians echoes both James Morris Morgan's account of African Americans in Reconstruction, South Carolina, and the depictions of blacks in the Citibank Minstrel Show. Black people are fungible for Bernard. Ooh. The West Indian is conscripted into a racial performance populated by white caricatures of African Americans, and in Five Years in Jungle Land, he acts as the interlocutor in the Panamanian scene of a worldly coon show staged for the city bankers in New York. The lingo of the West Indian, supposedly English, is almost incomprehensible to one whose ear has not been trained to it. They frequently misunderstand us Americans. For example, one day at breakfast, which is there, the midday meal served about 11 o'clock. The cook served meat, which was not touched. As we happen not be hungry, I told the cook to take it back and heat it up for dinner. At dinner, we had the customary layout, minus meat. When I inquired, he replied, Meet, sir, I thought, you told me to heat it up, sir. I affirmed that such was the case, and asked him to pronounce it. But, sir, he stammered, I did. I hate the lip, sir. I had neglected to take into consideration the valley English Hayat, you know? The city bank's overseas branches and Vanderlip's Ooh. engagement of the machinery of representation is part of the development of a larger financial and commercial infrastructure supporting U.S. foreign investment. Vanderlip Ooh. recognized that neither representations nor branches alone would bring business to the city bank. To this end, Vanderlip Ooh. organized two other supplementary entities to bring business to the city bank. First, he energized the National City Company, the controversial securities affiliate he had organized years earlier. In March 1916, Vanderlip oh. recruited a young, energetic bond salesman named Charles oh. E. Mitchell to run the NCC and authorized the NCC's purchase of N.W. Halsey & Co., the second largest bond house in the country. The purchase immediately gave the Citibank a $100 million bond portfolio. Vanderbilt also organized the American International Corporation, AIC, a holding company whose purpose was to facilitate the movement of U.S. capital and manufactured goods overseas. Drawing on the combined strength of the country's largest financial and manufacturing concerns, the AIC was to serve as a channel to funnel surplus capital into overseas development projects. Within a year of its organization, the AIC received more than 1,200 propositions for consideration. From the AIC's initial projects, building waterworks and sewage systems in Uruguay, it financed the construction of utilities and public works projects throughout the world. Subsidiaries like the China Corporation and the Grace Russian Company were for the development of railways and canals. The production of rubber, rosin, turpentine, and tea was consolidated through the formation of AIC's companies, including the United States Rubber Company, the Rosen and Turpentine Export Company, and Carter Macy and Company. 
Arguably, the AIC's most important contribution to U.S. foreign trade was its almost single-handed revitalization of the U.S. mercantile marine. In partnership with W.R. Grace, the AIC purchased a stake in the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, with lines extending from Baltimore through the Panama Canal and through the Pacific as far west as India. The AIC bought stock in the United Fruit Company, whose vessels traversed routes to the Caribbean and Central America, and purchased the International Merchantile Marine Company, a Morgan Ooh. Control Company, then a receivership. The AIC also acquired the New York Ship Building Corporation and its 160-acre facility in Camden, New Jersey. The purchase made the AIC the world's largest shipbuilding concern. During the war, it garnered guaranteed contracts to the federal government's emergency fleet corporation for 200 ships. After the war, it tendered numerous commercial and private contracts. The AIC used the Citibank's branch network to handle its financial transactions, and the bank stood to make a profit from the service fees and exchange commissions on any transaction it handled. For Citibank, the AIC directors, AIC was to play as important a role in imperial financing and development as the Hudson's Bay Company and the East India Company. What appeared as a blur of activity on the part of Vanderbilt Ooh. and the Citibank in New York actually moved in a languid pace on the ground in the Caribbean and Latin America. And what for Vanderbilt Ooh. was meant to be a systematic and rational approach to internationalization was prone to poor judgment, human error, vanity, and the frisions of cultural difference. The result was an often haphazard, improvisatory, and experimental system. The practical, quotidian life of finance capitalism and U.S. imperialism as ordered through the Citibank Warren branch system often appeared frail and tenuous. Mm. Vanderlip appointed a branch bank committee that operated out of an office at 55 Wall Street and consisted of members of the Foreign Exchange and Foreign Trade Departments, as well as of the IBC and included at various times Stephen H. Bernese, Roger L. Barnham, John E. Garber, William S. Jones, as well as Florence M. Jacobs and H.T.S. Green of the IBC. They held weekly meetings where they read aloud the incoming correspondence of the branch banks, discussed issues of policy, and authorized return memos. The meetings were consumed with the most mundane matters of policy and management, details of staffing arrangements, salary demands, requests for transfers and vacations, the resolution of personal disputes between foreign staff members and personal and family members. They passed judgment on larger loan issues and foreign credits and considered questions of further branch expansion and the takeover of local institutions. In these meetings, for instance, they considered opening a branch at Camagüey in eastern Cuba to serve the Cuban Railway Company and passed judgment on the viability of opening branches of the IBC in Santo Domingo and San Pedro Macorís. They discussed the possibilities of acquiring the Danish Bank of the West Indies after Barnham wrote a report recommending purchase if the United States took over the Danish islands. Barnham reported on a meeting he had with the State Department concerning the Citibank's acquisition of the Merchantile Bank of the Americas. It was a proposition the committee agreed they were not interested in pursuing. The problems of foreign branch banking were most pronounced in Cuba, the location of the Citibank's most dramatic growth. The Cuban branches highlighted the difficulties of management and the associated questions of authority exercised over distance. The relations between the home office at 55 Wall Street, the Havana branch headquarters, and the Santiago de Cuba subbranch surfaced in the letters and memos sent from Cuba inquiring about bank policy, seeking advice on branch management, and complaining about staff personalities. There were questions concerning who had the authority to approve the loans and overdrafts of the sub-branches, and to what amount. There were grievances about staff and staffing. Garden rejected the request from D.A. Menical in Rio de Janeiro for a move to Havana because of his lack of judgment, and Menical was later sent to Peking to manage a branch of the IBC. There were questions of salary increases. There were attempts to settle conflicts between Havana and Santiago. After numerous letters from 
Juan B. Roque mm. of the Havana branch complaining about the conduct of the Santiago branch, the committee wrote to Roque mm. to tell him to stop interfering with the daily operations of the Santiago branch and warn the Santiago branch to keep better track of its loans. To the dismay of the committee, Roque mm. also applied for a $10,000 personal loan from the bank. The committee decided to refuse it. In the correspondence between New York and Havana, a practical branch policy slowly congealed out of a set of informal approaches. Cuba's importance to the Citibank was largely due to the status of the political economy of Cuban sugar in the context of World War I. Cuba officially joined the Allied Powers in 1917, but its economic allegiances were clear long before that. An economic defense law passed on October 29, 1914 to protect the economy against the financial instability of the war demonetized all foreign currencies except that of the United States, while establishing a Cuban national currency at par with the U.S. dollar, breaking the government's reliance on the French and Spanish bullion that had become prohibitively expensive as a result of the war. The new law helped rationalize many of Cuba's daily commercial transactions while trying the national currency and the Cuban economy to the U.S. dollar. Sugar and tobacco acceptances were exclusively paid either in new national currency or in U.S. dollars. The quotations on the Havana stock and produce exchange were made in Cuban instead of Spanish gold. The complicated custom of keeping multiple accounts that had so vexed the early bookkeepers and accountants of the National Bank of Cuba was done away with, and the hundreds of money changers in the streets of Havana were forced out of business. The war years saw the rapid growth of banking in Cuba. Both Cuban and Spanish institutions expanded their branch networks throughout the country while growing the portfolio of credits to sugar planters. The National Bank of Cuba, now controlled by Jose Pote Lopez Rodriguez, led the way, expanding its branch network throughout the island and converting its New York City agency into a state bank, the Bank of Cuba in New York, with offices at 34 Wall Street. Older banking institutions, including the venerable Spanish Bank of the island of Cuba, merchant banks such as H. Upman and N. Gellitz, and local upstarts, like the International Bank of Cuba, extended their domestic branch networks while competing to offer planters loans. North American financial institutions, including the Royal Bank of Canada, the Bank of Nova Scotia, and the Standard Bank of Canada, also began to play an increasingly important role in Cuba's banking landscape. Between 1914 and 1920, the number of bank branches in Cuba almost doubled, growing from 148 to 294. From 1916 to 1920, deposits in domestic banks increased from $109 million to $325 million. In foreign banks, they showed similar growth, expanding from $30.7 million to $88 million. The Citibank followed suit. The bank built on the connections it had made to the Bank of the Havana and its own increased investments in the Cuban economy. It used the occasion of the opening of the West Indian branch in Havana as an opportunity to seek out accounts from Cuban sugar planters. The bank opened a $2 million line of credit for Manuel Rionda and the Zarco Rionda Company, and later invited Rionda to join the board of directors of the bank, an offer he declined. The National City Company issued a $6 million bond for the Cuban American Sugar Company, controlled by board member Robert Hawley, who was the owner of a number of holdings in the Caribbean Republic, including the Chaparra Sugar Company, the Chaparra Railroad Company, the San Manuel Sugar Company, the Tingaro Sugar Company, the Mercedita Sugar Company, the Cuban Sugar Refining Company, the United Sugar Company, and the Colonial Sugars Company. The city bank's participation in the Cuban sugar industry peaked in 1917 with the announcement that the entire Cuban sugar crop of three and a quarter million tons would be funded by a syndicate of U.S. banks and then purchased by the United States Sugar Equalization Board stabilizing the market while guaranteeing Cuba's economic success.
the year was not without conflict, however. U.S. troops landed in Cuba to protect the interests of U.S. sugar properties in the eastern provinces after a shore uprising against President Mario Garcia Menotti. Mm. A military order designed to stabilize the regional economy during the crisis saw the Santiago of Cuba branches of the Citibank, Royal Bank of Canada, and the National Bank of Cuba briefly suspend operations. Mm. The manager of the Citibank Santiago of Cuba branch later defied an order from insurgent commander Rigoberto Fernandez mm. to reopen, informing Fernandez <sighs> that he would have to petition the head office in New York. The year following the Armatis was marked by a tumult and change for the city bank. In March 1918, James <sighs> Tillman died. With his death, the city bank lost not only a figure who had shaped its destiny for almost three decades, but a man who represented a living, historical connection to the old merchant world of New York. In July 1919, Frank A. <sighs> Vanderlip resigned. Vanderlip's resignation came to a sudden surprise to Wall Street as he was well regarded both within and outside the bank. Before Stillman's death, however, conflicts between the two men had been simmering. Vanderlip had sought a greater share of stock in the bank as his influence and its operations increased, but he had been repeatedly rebuffed by Stillman, the largest shareholder, who wanted to retain his control. There were other issues. The city bank's branches in Russia were nationalized by the Bolshevik government soon after they were opened in 1917. The bank lost all of its deposits and Vanderlip mm. was held responsible. As a tour in Europe at the conclusion of the war, Vanderlip quickly wrote and published an assessment of conditions there whose frank allocations of blame and bold prescriptions of reconstruction upset the city bank directors. He was forced out. James Jamie Ooh. Alexander Stillman, Stillman's son, was appointed bank president following Vanderlip's Ooh. departure. The elder Stillman's final words to his son were reportedly, Jamie, Ooh. never, never accept the president of the bank. Don't let them make you take it. While Ooh. Stillman increased the Citibank's capital from $25 million to $40 million, he was a mediocre banker and a weak leader. His short tenure at the Citibank was marked by both personal and political economic crises. Even before Vanderlip's Ooh. resignation, change was afoot in the Citibank's foreign operations. In January 1919, Ooh. Roger Farnham was removed from the Caribbean district and reassigned to a fledgling district consisting of Africa and Australia. Appointed in Farnham's Ooh. place was John A. Gallant, the vice president in charge of the South American district. Allen had managed the National Bank of the Republic of Haiti in Port-au-Prince and opened the Citibank's first foreign branch in Buenos Aires. Allen brought energy and aggression to the Citibank's Caribbean branch organization. His editorials and essays in the Americas were enthusiastic statements on the growth of U.S. Caribbean trade and he matched his rhetoric with policy, supercharging the bank's branch expansion. Allen ordered his subordinates to ramp up the opening of new branches in Cuba while increasing the bank's branch footprint throughout the Caribbean region. By July 1919, the city bank had 21 branches in the Caribbean district. It added four in Cuba, parentheses in Santa Clara, Union de Reyes, Pinar del Rio, and Ciego de Avila. A second branch in Venezuela in the Caribbean port city of Marachoabo, and a branch in Port of Spain, Trinidad, British West Indies. In Port of Spain, it encountered local resistance from the Canadian Bank of Commerce and the Royal Bank of Canada. They argued that a U.S. bank should not be permitted entry into the colony, as British banks could not operate in New York. By August 1919, six more branches were organized in Cuba and the IBC added two in Asia. September witnessed more branch openings in Cuba, in Brazil, and in the Dominican Republic, where the IBC opened a new branch. On January 1, 1919, the Citibank had 15 foreign branches. By December 31st, it had 47. The Citibank's 25th Cuba branch was opened at Nuvitas in March 1920. By the end of 1920, the Citibank had 95 overseas branches. 
the most branches of a U.S. banking institution and a network rivaled only by the Royal Bank of Canada among North American banks. The branch expansion under Ooh. Allen was matched by the Citibank's lending policy. It was ambitious and loose, with competition from other financial institutions. Credit was made easily available, and rather than risking losing business, money was offered with little collateral, little inquiry into personal backgrounds, and often on properties that were heavily mortgaged but whose profits depended on the maintenance of the price of sugar. Through the war, sugar markets were stabilized through the regulation of the Sugar Equalization Board. But the board's belated decision to refuse to purchase the Cuban sugar crop late in 1919 exposed the commodity to the mercurial temperaments of the open market. The price of sugar skyrocketed as rumors of scarcity prompted hoarding by consumers and distributors and encouraged the operations of speculators and shysters. Speculators stockpiled sugar in an attempt to influence prices. Their efforts worked. On May 20, 1920, Cuban raw sugar reached 22.5 cents per pound on the New York Sugar and Coffee Exchange, the highest price in history, and a figure far surpassing the 5 or 6 cents most commentators believe was necessary to sustain the Cuban market. The inflation in values, or what one witness described as a distortion of values, unleashed a period of easy money as both local and foreign bankers sought to capture quick profits off the rising prices of sugar and other commodities. In the Cuban countryside, especially in the eastern provinces of Oriente and Camagüey, the upheavals of geography that had begun during the war continued apace. Ancient forests were clear-cut and replaced by yields of sugar cane. Angular, modern centrales, or sugar mills, were thrown up against the horizon. A shoddy boom town of banks, brothels, hotels, and canteens, all filled with black immigrant labor brought in from Jamaica and Haiti by U.S. sugar companies, was cobbled together to support the industry. In Havana, there was increased investment in real estate and increased spending on consumer goods by the Cuban new rich. Sugar had turned Havana into gold. The city expanded east past the remains of the wall that once marked its boundaries into Vadadu and across the El Mandaris River into Miramar, where merchants and financiers built massive suburban estates. Havana's rapid population growth, combined with skyrocketing inflation, made affordable housing scarce. Rolls Royces, Isada Franchinis, and Packers competed for space on the Prado and Melcon with taxi cabs, guy guides, and electric trams, and Havana's new rich thronged to the casino, the races, the Jayalai frontons, and the pornographic theaters. But behind the facade of prosperity, another city was becoming visible. The cost of labor and machinery had increased 100%, and that of transportation between 30 and 40%, contributing to an inflation in prices that was felt in all aspects of life. Housing became all but unaffordable to anyone who could not build a mansion in Vadadu or Mariana, as property speculation increased alongside speculation in sugar. Frustrated tenants staged rent strikes, and Cuban President Menico Ooh. complained of the outrageous profiteering by landlords, though he claimed he was powerless to do anything about it. The Citibank staff had to economize, Bachelors moved into shared accommodations, and married couples rented apartments together. Streetcar workers went on strike, and Steve Dorez demanded pay rises. Havana was subjected to almost daily bomb attacks by what the press dubbed anarchists and revolutionary Negroes while the signs of resentment toward black immigrant labor were becoming visible. The Citibank had contributed to the inflation of values and the feverish culture of speculation in Cuba. Porfirio Ooh. Franca and Juan B. Roque Ooh. in the Havana branch had authorized loans far in excess of the limits set by the New York Committee. Advancing credits on properties that could not realize value and with collateral and security that was dubious at best. The Citibank made heavy advances to Colonos. The small, often highly indebted, independent planters 
tied to the mills through long-term contracts who were considered risky clients at the best of times and to the sugar mill owners themselves who sought to expand their mills in anticipation of the coming harvest at rates and amounts that presumed that the high price of sugar would be sustained indefinitely. The Hershey Company borrowed heavily from the bank, plowing funds into the expansion of its Cuban properties. Cuban estate owner Marcelino Ooh. Garcia Beltram borrowed $15 million to refurbish his plantations. Advances were made to Cuban President Menico Ooh. for his personal purchase of mills and plantations. Roquet Ooh. was pushing the bank to authorize a $5 million loan to planter Domingo Ooh. Leon for the purchase and expansion of sugar properties. Roquet was also agitating to join Ooh. Leon as a business partner. Fueled by speculation and enabled by loose lending practices, the price of sugar reached 22.5 cents per pound on May 22, 1920. Writing in the Americas, John H. Allen was characteristically enthusiastic about Cuba. He argued that Cuba could easily double its output of sugar, the only impediment to the expansion of the sugar industry being a shortage of labor. Mm. Allen's assessment would soon appear misguided and delusional. By the end of the summer of 1920, the price of sugar had begun a precipitous decline. As sugar dropped from its heights in May, companies like Cuba Cane Sugar and Punta Alegre experienced a steady decline in valuation. Credit became increasingly constricted as worried bankers no longer lent as freely as before. The circulation and movement of goods slowed to a crawl as buyers found they could not afford many of the U.S. and European goods they had ordered during the boom times. Collections lagged, and the port of Havana became congested, partly because of an inefficient lettering system, partly because importers could no longer afford their orders. In September, rumors appeared in the Cuban press that a young businessman had withdrawn all his assets from various banks and placed them in a safe deposit box. They say wrote the Times of Cuba, that he must expect a panic or something. On October 11, 1920, panic hit. Merchant Pedro Gomez Mena presented a draft, rumored to be over $2 million, to the International Bank of Cuba, one of the mushroom banks that had sprouted during the boom years, opening branches across the country. When news got out that the International Bank was unable to redeem Mena's draft, panic depositors stormed its Havana headquarters in a desperate attempt to withdraw their funds. While the International Bank was forced to suspend payment, the panic spread throughout Havana as confidence in the banking system plummeted. A two-day banking run ensued that was only halted when Cuban President <coughs> Manico intervened. After consulting with the banking community and local merchants, Manico <coughs> declared a 50-day moratorium on bank withdrawals. The Citibank declined to take part in the moratorium, continuing the policy of ready money that had secured the bank its reputation during the tenures of both Moses Ooh. Taylor and James Stone. Ooh. It was subject to heavy withdrawals from depositors and was forced to ship almost a million dollars a day from the United States to Cuba to bolster its reserves. By November, $16.1 million had been sent to the Havana branch, but it kept its doors open to its customers. In the initial days of the crises, Havana branch manager Porfirio Ew. Franco worked alongside his counterparts at the Royal Bank of Canada, the Trust Company of Cuba, the Bank of Nova Scotia, and other institutions to draft a memorandum offering a solution to the banking crisis. They suggested the organization of a clearinghouse for Havana and the issuance of a collateral trust certificate that would ease the illiquidity of capital and provide planters with a means of short-term financing that could fund the harvest. Their plan was dismissed outright by the State Department. As delegations of Wall Street bankers buzzed through Havana streets and visited Cuba's sugar properties, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson appointed U.S. lawyer Albert Rothbone as a financial advisor to the Cuban government. Rothbone's appointment prompted the resignation of the finance minister, Leopoldo Cancio. Rathbone spent two weeks in Havana at Concio's desk and wrote a report saying little that the Cubans did not already know. He recommended that Cuba contract a loan from Wall Street and sell the previous year's sugar crop to inject liquidity into the banking system. 
Upon his return to the United States, Rathbone promptly billed the Cuban government $50,000 for his service. The remaining sugar crop was left unsold. Purchasers refused to buy, even with the price hovering around $0.05 cents per pound. Planters were unable to generate credits from the banks for the coming crop. Medical petitioned Wall Street for a $50 million loan to shore up the price of sugar and maintain the government, the banking industry, and the Cuban economy. Wall Street refused. While the bankers offered credits to their own interests, they argued that they could not lend financial support to sugar growers, given that American cotton and wheat growers were facing the same depressed prices for their own crops and had been denied relief. Medical Ew. also sent planter and financier Jose Miguel Barraza, who had earlier partnered with Roland Conklin on the consolidation of Cuba's railroad, to New York City to confer with Citibank director Robert B. Hall, Ew. also a director of the Cuban American Sugar Company. Hawley let Menacol know that the Citibank would offer $10 million to Cuban planters and asked the Cuban government for some word of expression from you to the bank commending its action. Menacol was happy to oblige. I need hardly say that such an attitude on the part of a great financial institution like the city is highly gratifying, Menacol gushed. And doubly welcome in the present trying moment, as it will materially help to strengthen confidence in the fundamental stability and future prosperity of Cuba, whose economic situation, while temporarily disturbed, is fundamentally sound. I shall appreciate it if you would be good enough to convey to the board of directors of the National City Bank my personal appreciation of their attitude and to assure them that such disinterested and friendly action will not be soon forgotten. John H. Ooh. Allen tempered his earlier assessments of Cuban affairs but remained cautiously optimistic. In The Americas, he argued that Cuba was experiencing a normal situation given the recent excessive financing. Was the potential exasperation or aggravation of the situation stemming from an overreaction on the part of the Cubans? He stated that, by reason of the temperament of the Cuban people, who, he asserted, were not always open to wise counsel or known for cool-headedness, the situation could be inflamed. He otherwise saw the crisis as a necessary readjustment and suggested that although there should be concern about speculation in real estate, sugar, and other commodities, he was hopeful about Cuba's future. It was Allen's Ooh. last essay in The Americas and his final public statement on behalf of the Citibank. With the turmoil in Cuba, the directors had seen enough, and Allen was forced to resign from the bank at the end of October 1920. Almost immediately after leaving the city bank, he assumed the position of president of the American Foreign Banking Corporation, which was controlled by the city bank's emergent rival, the Chase National Bank of the City of New York. In the wake of Allen's dismissal, the overseas division of the bank was reorganized. Roger L. Farnham was recalled to take charge of the Caribbean district. Its purview now expanded to include the West Indies, Central America, Australia, and Southern Africa. Farnham promptly traveled by steamer from New York City to Cuba, accompanied by Vera Brown. Brown was a newly appointed City Bank Vice President who was recruited from the Canadian Bank of Commerce, where he had worked since 1889. Most recently in Winnipeg, Manitoba, as manager of its Western Canadian Division. While Farnham <coughs> toured the Citibank sugar properties, Brown studied the accounts in the Havana branch and interviewed its staff. Both men came away with a favorable impression of the management of the Cuban operations. The only problem Brown <coughs> saw was in the difficulties Cuba's commercial houses were experiencing from the overextension of finance. He worried that if the moratorium were lifted, they would fail. But he was as optimistic as Alan. <coughs> as far as our interest in the sugar business is concerned, Brown <coughs> reported, I can imagine no banking credits to growers and manufacturers being on a more satisfactory basis as to securities and loans resting on the cane and sugar contracts in use in Cuba. Moreover, the record of the sugar crop reveals a comparative freedom from serious failure. In any case, failure of a sugar crop is not as costly to the grower as is failure to a cereal crop. In Brown's assessment, many of the problems of the city bank in Cuba 
were down to questions of personality and branch management. Both the internal dynamics of the Havana branch and its relations to the home office at 55 Wall Street and to the country branches, he found that Havana branch manager Porfirio mm. Franco was laboring under a feeling of injured pride, as his authority had been undermined by mm. Allen on the one hand and the sub-managers on the other, and argued that the bank should clean up and rationalize the lines of authority and responsibility. Barnham's mm. impression was also positive. He returned to New York City and immediately worked to authorize a line of credit to Cuban planters. Barnham was back in Cuba in the spring of 1921. Upon arriving in Havana, he conferred with the staff of the Cuba Street branch and assessed the nature of its loans and the quality of its collateral. He met with General Enoch Crowder, sent to Cuba by President Wilson to oversee the fall 1920 election. He had an audience in the National Palace with newly elected President Alfredo Zayas. He conferenced with the officials of the Temporary Commission of Bank Liquidation, the Cuban government agency supervising the liquidation of the failed Cuban banks. Barnham gave few words to the press during this visit, but both the banking and the sugar situation appeared dire. Faith and confidence in banking institutions and the financial system had been gutted. Businesses refused to use checks, currency was suspect, gold was reappearing as a medium of exchange, the practice of hoarding returned as millions of dollars were withdrawn from banks and placed in safe deposit boxes, pillowcases, drawers, and mason jars, resulting in millions of dollars being taken out of circulation. The Citibank, whose investments in the Republic were once seen as a beacon of economic modernity, national development, and civilizational progress, was increasingly viewed in Cuba with a bitter opprobrium. Similar to the Spanish Bank of the Island of Cuba decades before, it was being recast as a symbol of neo-colonialism and a sign of the extinguishment of Cuban sovereignty. As a result of defaults to sugar properties, the deeds of 56 sugar mills, one quarter of the mills in Cuba, were now in the hands of the city bank. In January 1921, the Havana Daily, El Mundo, Spark runs on both the Citibank and the RBC and forced Roger mm. Farnham to join with the RBC's FRB mm. in appealing to the U.S. State Department to intervene. J.P. Morgan's Dwight Morrow mm. in Cuba for loan negotiations with the government asked General Crowder to talk to El Mundo's editor, Rafael Govan. Govan flatly refused to stop publishing the attack, allegedly because he felt they were good for circulation. North American banks were defended by some members of the Cuban press. El Mercurio, for instance, described El Mundo's attack as pernicious libel. But the damage was done. The Citibank took out advertisements in the Cuban press, reminding customers that the Cuban branches were backed by the reserves of Wall Street. Even so, attacks made the work of reconstruction difficult. The Citibank was forced to increase its reserves from 25% to sometimes upward of 65% as a safeguard against panic and contagion, which meant that the amount of capital that could circulate decreased, as did the bank's profits. Along with other foreign institutions, the city bank threatened to withdraw from the island entirely if the tax against them did not stop. Things took a turn for the worst that spring. On April 29th, weeks after Farnham's mm. departure, the National Bank of Cuba's Jose mm. Cote Rodriguez hung himself in his Vedado mansion. The suicide of the president and largest stockholder of the National Bank of Cuba spurred a wave of banking failures over the coming year that would leave dozens of Cuban banks with hundreds of country branches shuttered and untold losses to Cuban depositors. The Citibank was not unaffected by the crisis. Of the $60 million loaned to Cuban sugar producers, 80% or $48 million amounting to 60% of the bank's working capital was at risk. A total of $25 million was wiped off the bank's books. A number of Cuban branches were closed in an attempt to consolidate their operations. The effects of the collapse in commodity prices also reverberated throughout the Caribbean region. In August 1921, the Port of Spain branch was sold and the Colombian branches were shut down. In Panama, the IBC's branches were subjected to repeated runs by nervous depositors. 
during 1921, Farnham worked to ensure credits were available to the Citibank's Cuban customers and to the Cuban government, and he returned a number of times to the Republic, but his standing in the bank was faltering. He was at the center of two of the biggest crises the city bank had faced in its more than 100 year history. The crisis in Cuba following the dance of millions and the investigation of the bank's activities in Haiti following the sensational accounts of the U.S. occupation. As Frank mm. A. Vanderlip's appointee, Farnham mm. represented an old regime within the city bank. A regime that for many inside the bank was beginning to look like a failure. New blood and new ideas were needed. When James mm. A. Stillman resigned the Citibank presidency in 1921 after a brief scandal-ridden tenure, Farnham's mm. time with the bank appeared to be nearing an end. Stillman's mm. replacement, Charles Edwin mm. Mitchell, took the bank in a new direction. He abandoned many of the practices initiated during the Citibank's first era of imperial expansion under Frank Ooh. A. Vanderlip and James Stillman, Ooh. and he began gathering a new team of managers and vice presidents. Where Farnham Ooh. was at one time invaluable to Ooh. Vanderlip and Stillman, Ooh. Joseph H. Durrell, a relatively new hire at the bank, and at one time Farnham's subordinate, became Mitchell's Ooh. right-hand man in the Caribbean. In 1923, Durrell was promoted to lead the Caribbean district. Ooh. Farnham, after more than a decade with the city bank, resigned. Ooh. Farnham's involvement with the Caribbean did not end in 1923. He remained involved with U.S. business in the Caribbean. He was still president of the Caribbean Construction Company, the Haiti Company, and the National Railroad of Haiti. In 1920, he had also been appointed as the receiver of the National Railroad. As the U.S. Federal District Court initiated proceedings to protect the railroad's investors and creditors and to oversee the rehabilitation of its construction. In 1924, a hearing was held in New York to determine the payments due to those involved in the receivership. For his work as receiver, Farnham was paid $100,000, with an additional yearly salary set at $18,000. Sullivan and Cromwell, his old employers who now served as his attorneys, received $80,000. Julius M. Mayer, the justice who had allocated the payments, was gushing in his praise of Farnham. <coughs> Mayer proclaimed that he could not fully express in language his sense of appreciation to <coughs> Farnham for his work as receiver over the past four years. He asserted that if the amount at the disposal of the court were larger, he were more. He should not hesitate to award Farnham Ooh. larger compensation. Others were more critical of Farnham's Ooh. role in Haiti and less enthusiastic about his lucrative payouts. Farnham, Ooh. noted one critic, has been an expensive luxury for the Haitian peasants to support. The same thing could have been said about the Citibank and the Caribbean. 